Uh, we have uh, remarks from two presidents, President Jimmy Carter and President Bill Clinton. I'm pleased to know that so many of you have gathered in Boston on President's Day under the auspices of the National Archives and the Presidential Library System to examine the history of the presidency and our nation's struggle to expand civil rights for all its citizens. I regret that I could not join you in person as I have fond memories of officially dedicating the Kennedy Library when it opened in 1979 and returning to speak there last year. I understand that Ray Suarez, who moderated the forum with me last spring, is participating in this conference, as well as two civil rights heroes, my fellow native Georgian, Charlene Hunter Galt, and Ernie Green, who served in my administration. I salute them and all the distinguished panelists and thank them for participating in this historic event. As I stated at the Kennedy Library dedication ceremony, quote, as a Southerner, as a Georgian, I saw firsthand how the moral leadership of the Kennedy administration helped to undo the wrongs that grew out of our nation's history, unquote. And I suggested that the struggle to promote equal rights and opportunities for all is ongoing, and it must be shaped by the following principles. We are all Americans. We're all children of the same God. Racial violence and racial hatred can have no place among us. And that the moral imperative of those who led the march for civil rights during our lifetimes still remains with us today. Having grown up on a farm with only black playmates and neighbors, I recognized the blight of racial discrimination and made human rights in the foundation of our foreign policy when I was president. Since then, in our work at the Carter Center, the broadest definition of human rights has been the umbrella on which all our projects have been conducted, including peace, freedom, democracy, and the provision of shelter, food, education, health care, self-respect, and hope for a better future. Unfortunately, since 9-11, we have seen an abridgment of social and political freedoms in our country and multiple violations of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in our efforts to combat terrorism. Once again, I applaud David Ferrero, the archivist of the United States, and all those involved in putting together day, today's conference. I'm honored to have been asked to share these few words with you, and especially encourage the young people who are in the audience today to pick up the mantle of Ernie Green and Charlene Hunter Gold, of Harris Wofford and Roger Wilkins, and to serve as our nation's next generation of leaders in this ongoing struggle to build a more just and equitable nation and a more peaceful world. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm sorry I can't be there with you today, but I'm glad to be able to welcome you to this terribly important conversation. Though much has changed in our country since the passing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, our work on civil rights is far from finished. I saw this unfinished work firsthand, first as a Southern governor and then as president. Through my administration's national initiative on race, I work to bring our country closer together across the racial divides to prepare for a 21st century in which we're all bound together. I'll never forget the horrific string of arsons that destroyed historically black churches in the South and the work we did to put an end to them, to heal and to move forward together. Today, there are new challenges to civil rights and social progress, both within and beyond our borders. And it's more important than ever that we have conversations like this, that we work to build a country of shared values, shared opportunities, and shared responsibilities. Because we continue to believe that as important as our differences are, our common humanity matters more. So thanks again for being here. I hope you have a very productive conference. Before we open this last panel, I want to thank uh, four colleagues for all their work and support of the conference. First, uh, my colleague Tom McNaught, Executive Director of the Kennedy Library Foundation, Nancy McCoy, our Director of Education, Carol Ferguson, who provides all the technical support, and Amy McDonald, our forum producer extraordinaire. Uh, I also wanted to... Uh, recognize uh, a young uh, civil rights uh, attorney who ventured down into the South during the Kennedy administration as part of the uh, Justice Department working for John Doerr. Judge uh, Gordon Martin is here with us, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And lastly, moderator's prerogative. You notice we took Charlene's book away from her. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so based on the uh, last comment from uh, President Clinton, he said, there are new challenges in our world today for civil rights and social progress, and that's really what this last panel is about. I wanted to begin with Ray Suarez. Um, President uh, Carter just uh, invoked God by saying we're all children of the same God, and when President Kennedy introduced his legislation, <coughs> uh, he said that we faced a moral crisis as a country and, and a people that was old as the scriptures and as clear as the Constitution. And clearly, Martin Luther King uh, led the movement, uh, really steeped in religion. You've written a book, uh, The Holy Vote, The Politics of Faith in America, and write about the advent of the culture wars and how religion has really become a polarizing uh, feature of our current national politics and less successful, you write, in helping us to create the blessed community. Is it no longer wise or successful strategy to invoke religious and moral values to promote the cause of civil rights? Well, you have to understand that if you invoke religion, it doesn't get you the same portion of the audience that it once did. At a time in our past when almost everyone in the country was in some way either lightly affiliated or strongly affiliated with one of the Abrahamic religions, and almost everybody in the country was culturally educated in it, you pulled in almost everyone listening to you when you invoked a common religious heritage for this country. But the United States is so much more religiously diverse than it was earlier in our history. The largest single <coughs> faith group, or the, largest, uh, the fastest growing faith group in the United States, and one of the largest, is no religious affiliation at all. It's roughly 16 to 18 percent of the population and growing faster than any religious group. We are no longer, as part of a common culture, educated and steeped in the language of religion in the way that we once were, where uh, if a president used a line from a psalm, we would all know what it was. If a president used a line from one of the first five books of the Old Testament, uh, we might all know, or most of us in the audience might know who it was. So when you invoke it in that way, you may divide as much as you unite, which makes it a very, very tricky gesture. Also, we have kind of a running sore in this country when it comes to making one people out of this 311 million of us, and that is what we're going to do and how we're going to regard Islam the new kid on the block, the faith of millions of our fellow Americans, and yet regarded with unending suspicion, isolation, and uh, as we saw in the cases of uh, mosque bombings and uh, various kinds of vandalism, the lack of building permits and pickets outside various uh, Muslim places of worship around the country, we're not quite sure where to go next, and like with so many struggles in our history, which where civil rights really involved opening, making our arms wider. We don't know if we, we're yet ready to open them wide enough to include the millions of Muslims who are now our fellow Americans. So religion, how to regard religion, and the place that religion has in making us one people is all still contested terrain in 2012 and only gets more complicated with every year. Uh, Charlene, similarly, you talked about the role of the media in the civil rights uh, struggle in the 60s and how getting the media on and getting those pictures. But also today, the media seems to be a more complicated picture. Is the media on the side of promoting the cause of civil rights today? Can it still be used as effectively it was, it was in the 60s? I, I, I think the media are as confused as Ray just talked about the American people over religion. You know, we were talking just before we started about the, the, the multiplicity of media uh, uh, forums today. You know, you've got the internet, you've got your cell phone, you've got things I probably don't even know about. Uh, <laughs> uh, some of these young people could probably help me out here a little bit. But there's so many different ways of communicating uh, that, that it's hard to get any centrality of ideas 
uh, put across other than maybe on the news hour, right? <laughs> <laughs> my, my former home, I have to say that. Um, the other thing that's very troubling to me, I live in South Africa most half of the year and here the other half. And I have noticed in the past few years a diminishing pool of African-American uh, people in prominent positions on television. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it's happening, um, but there are very few uh, who, who were, had the kind of positions they had post-1968 when the Kerner Commission, uh, the President Johnson's Commission, um, cited the media as part of the culpable uh, cited culpability of the media in the riots because there were no black people or people who looked like the people who were rioting who could tell them, who could have told them about the simmering rage that was going on in those communities. And there's simmering rage going on in this country today based on some of the same inequities that we thought we had ended uh, uh, with the Civil Rights Act and, 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 and that kind of legislation. And, and it's a ticking time bomb. I mean, you've got uh, uh, the whole question that Michelle Alexander deals with in her book, The New Jim Crow. All these black men in prison, mm -hmm. and often for, I started to say a word I can't say in this forum, for um, what kind of reasons shall I say? Reasons that aren't legitimate, let's put it yeah. that way. Well, <laughs> you did SOS earlier and you recovered very quickly. I couldn't think of a, a word that would quite accurately describe how I feel about that. But there is so much that is going on that is just beneath the surface and nobody's really drilling down into it and reporting on it. So what worries me about this proliferation of media is that the proliferation of media uh, is, exists, but it's not drilling down into some of the very real social problems that we have in a society. And I know this is going to be controversial, but I'm going to say it anyway. We are not in a post-racial society. I'm sorry if there are those who think we are, but if you look at the data on, on just about every indication of, 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 of pro progress in this country, you'll find black people pretty much at the bottom. I heard the other day that black unemployment is going down a bit, but it's still twice as high as white. So there's, there's, it, where are the people who are looking into these things and, and doing very good analysis of what's going on. So I'm very disappointed in the media today, with some notable exceptions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so again, um, there's so many things to talk about in this panel, but Roger, one thing, uh, we didn't talk that much about your service in the Johnson administration, but certainly one of the hallmarks of that administration was the passage of the Voting Rights Act. And, and that act also was really somewhat sacrosanct in our political culture for years. But now there seems to be that even that is a divisive uh, issue and an issue of current political debate. Are we seeing a backlash towards voting rights? I think that uh, this fragmentation of the media uh, gives a path uh, and a mechanism or muscles to all kinds of nuts. You know, people who, uh, who are angry, people who, who, who want to uh, put the wrong people, whoever they may be, back in their place. And, and, not, but, and they get places to speak which are ostensibly um, decent. Um, I mean, I've heard stuff on some of these uh, news, uh, news uh, dispensers that aren't news dispensers at all. They're people who got nasty fruit to throw into uh, good communities. Uh, I don't, and and it's and it doesn't get it doesn't get better. It gets worse. Mm -hmm. I mean, it proliferates, and I I mean, there's some people who just went off the uh, air recently, but 
I don't, I don't think we figured out how to have free speech and freedom of the press and also mm -hmm. decency, civility, and truth. Uh -huh. you know, right. Makes it, it makes it very hard. Alita, I thought, uh, and this again, difficult question, such a large sweep, but talk about women's rights, uh, you know, since, uh, for Alita Black, um, you know, the um, uh, failure to pass the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, we're trying to kind of do civil rights then and now, but how do you, what's the struggle for women's rights and contemporary? This is my school partner. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, if I, any place that I can sit with Roger. Um, I'm not so concerned about passing the Equal Rights Amendment as I am about promoting <coughs> and risking life and limb to say that women's rights are human rights, human rights are women's rights, civil rights are human rights, human rights are civil rights. And I think that that, that is the major issue of our time. I think the, the sort of the, the unintended consequence, if you will, to echo Charlene's point, I mean, look at affirmative action. I mean, who did affirmative action help? You know, it helped white women more than it helped people of color. And so I think that women have a huge road to hoe. And I think that in many ways, um, despite the progress that we've made, there are still major stereotypes. I mean, I'm thrilled that Obama is my president. Okay. But I gave my heart and soul to Hillary Clinton. Okay. And I have known her since 1970. And I went to 15 states, 14 states. I knocked on 15,000 doors. And I can tell you the animosity that was still there for a woman running for president. And I got that much more than I got racial epithets about Obama. And so there's an undercurrent here that we still, that we still need to address, which is why I am so enormously proud of both of them for figuring out a way to devote their incomparable energies to building a world that is defined by the values that we share. And so I think that, that for women, what we've got to do is to figure out how to stand up for ourselves, talk for ourselves, build a community that is inclusive, and say that women's rights also help men, they also help children, they help people of every religion, and that they are, in fact, fundamental standards of human decency. Until we understand the problems of housing, of access to food, of access to education, the struggle if you look for first hired, you know, last hired, first fired, look at the teachers that are being let go, they're disproportionately women, and they're disproportionately people of color. I mean, it's a systemic thing here. But I think we have made significant progress, and, um, and I'm proud of that. But my great frustration to the young people that are in this audience is they are much more likely to know the stories of Charlene and the stories of Ernie Green and the incomparable courage that Roger has displayed throughout his career than they are to what happened to women in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s. And now with the um, new battle over contraception, I fear that we are gonna go back into this whole thing again. So I'm pretty worried. I'm gonna switch to a wholly different topic that President Carter brought up, uh, Ray, and that's the uh, question again of the civil rights of terrorist suspects uh, after 9-11. You're telling me that you um, reported on a story about that. And could you share that? With I us? was covering the uh, arrest and detention of Jose Padilla mm -hmm. and got very interested in it over time. And for those of you who don't remember, he was arrested in O'Hare Airport and accused of plotting a so-called dirty bomb attack in the heart of a major American city. That is, uh, an explosive would be tied to a portion of radioactive material which would then be scattered, rendering a place uh, poisoned and useless, so it would have to be uh, evacuated. Jose Padilla was born in Brooklyn, raised in Chicago, lived in Florida, was arrested in Illinois, and held without charge for two and a half years. 
most of that time in solitary confinement, in various kinds of restraints that also deprived him of his senses, so that he couldn't hear things, he couldn't see things, he couldn't speak to anybody, without being arraigned. Now, he was later found, tried and found guilty on charges totally separate from the ones for which he was arrested and held. So now he's been convicted to life in prison and there he is in prison. A bad guy, likely found to be guilty of plotting against the United States, <coughs> but it should arouse your attention, it should arouse your concern if you are an American and your fellow citizen can be picked up in the United States and held without being charged with anything for two and a half years. When I worked up a book proposal on the Padilla case and shopped it around to publishers, nobody wanted to print it because it was a downer, mm -hmm. as one publisher yeah. said. Now, yes, that's one of the reasons why it would be a good book, frankly. It's a downer. Uh -huh. It's a downer that it can happen. Okay. It's a downer that it did happen. It's a downer that Jose Padilla, because he was a Puerto Rican gangbanger and not um, the head of the local Lions Club or mm -hmm. Rotary, can be stuck away in a prison without mm -hmm. anybody giving a damn whether he's even there or whether he was ever tried. Mm -hmm. It should be something of tremendous concern to us all. And I have to say again, I'm not sticking up for the guy, if he's guilty of anything, then fine, let our legal system work and find him guilty and put him away for as long as the charges he's charged with merit his detention. But Americans should not be arrested in America by American law enforcement and then held without charge. That's Bill of Rights stuff. Absolutely. That's Magna Carta stuff. Now, I'm not an activist. I'm not an activist, I'm not a crusader, I'm just a guy who watches to see if people play by the rules. If those are the rules, and you know, the barons made King John sign that it was the rules in Runnymede in what, 1215. So that's been the rules for a long time. Uh, two and a half years without charge is an amazing thing, but it could happen to Jose Padilla because of who he was, but how, what would it take in this country for it to happen to you? or someone you know, or someone who lives in your neighborhood. Again, not because he's a good guy, the courts have found he's a bad guy. But what our legal protections, what our civil rights exist for, is not to protect the rights of good people. It's to protect the rights of people we suspect might be bad people. Mm -hmm. And the Jose Padilla case should be something that we don't forget very soon. I, I want to switch. Um gears just quickly and then get back to the panel. I know this is about contemporary struggles, but I want to take us back to Robert Kennedy's famous trip to South Africa so we can have the screen come down. And uh, he was invited by a group of students uh, while he was a senator. And after he accepted the invitation, the head of the organization uh, was actually arrested and was not allowed to uh, greet uh, Robert Kennedy. So a young woman named Margaret Marshall uh, was a student in South Africa at the time and we'll now hear her in this uh, film clip uh, by, uh, in a film by Larry Shore uh, called yeah. RFK, Ripple of Hope. Uh, and then I have a few questions for the panelists sure. based on this short clip. So Robert Kennedy no. in South <coughs> Africa in 1965. Oh, no, I was sitting here before. Sorry. Plus I got a lot of there hair. There were places for whites. There were places for what the government referred to as non-whites and never the twain mixed. And there we all were gathered in Johannesburg awaiting his arrival. We arrived at John Smart's airport, which had uh, those signs, non-whites only and whites only. He chose to go to the non-white area. That's where they put his podium. I don't think anybody anticipated that hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of people made their way to that airport, which was a long way outside Johannesburg. There was no public transportation. Black South Africans, very few of them, had access to automobiles. When Kennedy came, this person from almost out of space, really, 
when, when something like that happens to a people who are bottled up and oppressed, it, it sends through an, an electric shot through the communities of the coming of, of freedom. The airport was swarming with white, black, brown, Indian, every hue of skin. I don't think I had ever seen anything like that in my life. And so that very first night, we began to get an inkling of what this visit was going to entail. Well, the speech Robert Kennedy gave on that occasion was certainly the most important speech of his life. And I think it captured the essence of, of what he stood for and came to be known for when he ran for president. Particularly that one paragraph about the ripple of hope which has just been quoted over and over and over again. Each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. At the end of that speech, I remember as if he stopped and looked around as if to say, was that enough? Thank you. Charlene, you live in South Africa now and you've seen the transformation of that country and you were part of the transformation of this country. And I wonder, how does the U.S. look from an international perspective? You know, do people in Africa look to the U.S. as a, a, a beacon of civil rights, or, do, or are we losing that? Um... Well, I, I think historically, um, South Africans took great um, inspiration from our own struggle here uh, in America. But I think increasingly, you have a whole new generation of, of South Africans. We call them they are the born frees. They were born after Mandela's release. And so their uh, allegiance or, or even reverence for the past has diminished somewhat, just as, you know, and they look very critically, increasingly, at, um, at America, just as it's, America is being looked at increasingly more critically around the world, which is why it's really important to <clears throat> for those who have the opportunity to help America continue to um, stand as a beacon for civil and human rights and justice. And it's so coincidental that you would ask me this because just as Ray was talking about um, the gentleman he reported on, um, I recently wrote a piece for the New Yorker, the blog, about a guy in South Africa by the name of Dr. Death. Well, they call him Dr. Death. Uh, his name is Votre Basson, and he was the, uh, he's a cardiologist who during apartheid created poisons uh, aimed at killing anti-apartheid activists. Uh, cigarettes and chocolates laced with anthrax spores. Um, uh, they were working on a drug to make black women infertile so they wouldn't have more, give birth to more anti-apartheid mm -hmm. activists. That one never came off. They were also working on a, a poison that they could inject into Mandela when he was released that would ultimately give him a heart attack that couldn't be traced back to that yeah. potion. That didn't come off either, but the other things did, including a potion that they would take anti-apartheid activists up into airplanes and have them handcuffed and inject a paralyzing agent into their bodies so that when they dropped them into the sea, even if they were strong and could swim, they wouldn't be able to because they were paralyzed. Now this guy is still practicing medicine in South Africa and he got through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Mandela, in his effort to hire him as a, to show reconciliation, hired him after the end of apartheid. But now the, 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 the health professionals are trying to strip him of his license because he didn't act in a manner consistent with the Hippocratic Oath. His argument is that he was a soldier following orders. We've heard that uh, before. So I wrote this piece 
for the New Yorker the week that they tr tried him. The, the final uh, verdict is supposed to come down, or it's continuing on the 27th of, this, of March. And at the end, I quoted, I, I talked about how the pain continues to come back, even though people are trying mm -hmm. to, to shed this pain from apartheid. And I said, but some people have a different view of it. And there was a guy who called into the radio station, and he said, I don't know why uh, everybody's being so hard on what Walter Basson did during apartheid when American doctors are injecting prisoners on death row with lethal uh, uh, injections, mm -hmm. and they are part of torturing mm -hmm. uh, 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 prisoners at places like Guantanamo Bay, mm -hmm. uh, uh, who, who, whom they are trying to get uh, uh, a testimony about uh, um, uh, terrorism things. So, you know, the things, what, what, what we should realize is that as much as many of our uh, things in America have been beacons to, to others in the mm -hmm. world, our actions are pay, they're paying attention to our actions and people, even those that are not formally educated, are very sophisticated and they, they know more about what's going on in America that we, than we mm -hmm. know about what's Absolutely. going on in their country. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Alina, I wanted to use that clip to tell the rest of the story, which is that Margaret Marshall then came to the United States, was named first to the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court and then its <coughs> Chief Justice, and wrote the landmark decision uh, that allowed uh, same-sex couples to marry, saying that that right was guaranteed in the Massachusetts State Constitution. So can you t tell us about uh, the struggle for gay rights and how that's seen, and is, it, is, it, is there a parallel with the earlier stories yeah, that we I, heard? Yeah, I do. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd like to flip it for a little bit because I was pretty down in, in the first part, what I was talking about. I mean, I live in Virginia and um, my legislature is, there's no other word for it, they are Neanderthals. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I mean, Neanderthals. And, um, and my partner and I have been together for 21 years. And we have decided to get married and it was a big decision not because we're not committed, we're more, we're more monogamous and more financially intertwined than any couple I know. But um, we were gonna go to South Africa because Mandela got it in the Constitution. And we thought, what an extraordinary way to honor a man and a country that was really grappling with major issues. And then we decided to do it in the United States instead. And if I may be personal for a minute, I was an intern for Jimmy Carter. I wrote a grant that got $250,000 for Grady Hospital to set up the first rape crisis center in the South. That Grady would, outside of Miami, Grady would not hire any black counselors. So as an only arrogant 21-year-old can do, I gave the money back. You know, and, and I know, how stupid, right? But we set up the, you know, the multi-area rape crisis council and by God, Sandra Flowers and I ran it, you know. And, and most of the people that we saw were African American. When I wrote a grant for the Carter administration, and when he was governor, to start up maternal and infant health care, they set up the program, but they let me go because they thought that I might be a lesbian. Okay. Now, 20 years later, Bill Clinton is in the White House and my partner and I get invited to every Christmas party as a couple. I cannot tell you what that means. <coughs> and now a United States Senator, sorry, this is really, a United States Senator is gonna stand up and marry us. And I ran the Atlanta, I ran the Atlanta Gay Center, I helped set up Aid Atlanta, I have lost thousands of friends. I have three address books that I cannot throw away. I have seen people lose everything, everything. I have seen kids die in the street because hospitals would not take them. And to be able to stand in Washington, D.C., the capital of my country, who I still believe in, warts and all, and will deck anybody that wants to stop it, 
to be married in Washington, D.C. in the War Memorial for World War I, which was built by multiracial school children in Washington. The only memorial in Washington that has black and white names carved around it, men and women carved around it, and to have a United States Senator stand up and celebrate my human rights and my relationship with my partner of 21 years is revolutionary. And I revel in that. And if I may say one thing, when President Obama says that he stands on the shoulders of giants, I guarantee you that the people that will be with me are all the men I know who died and who did not need to die because our presidents would not respond to it. And now we have PEPFAR, we have a budget, we have a conference on AIDS, and we are doing something about it, and progress can come, but my God, is it painful. So, um, Ray, move, you know, this is a conference on civil rights in the presidency. We have the first African-American president. Um, what's, what's the narrative here? And, and um, you know, certainly one of the stories is the high expectations in the Latino community, for instance, on immigration reform and the DREAM Act, and then a sense that a president who isn't meeting those expectations. What's the Obama well, narrative on civil the rights? The important thing to remember is that the argument is never over and the work is never done. With each succeeding generation comes new arguments about who's fully human and who's fully a citizen and who's got the privilege of being a full member of this great extended family. When the founders drafted the Constitution, believe me, they never had any idea of Alita marrying her partner in the World War I Memorial <laughs> in D.C. And they never had any idea of Roger and Charlene sitting up here. And they never had any idea about me either, frankly. Um, so Charlene with each, and I haven't decided on you yet. Well, exactly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> jury is totally still out, and I get that. But, but we always take on more because America mm -hmm. is constantly widening the idea of what civil and human rights means and never narrowing it which is a great genius for a people to have. If you're going to have a sort of habit that you keep coming back to century after century, there are worse habits to have, like biting your nails. But, so we always widen the argument. When people were trying to get on public, in public accommodations uh, and mounting trailways in Greyhound and heading south, they didn't think they were doing it for people who wanted to go to the movies and were in a wheelchair, and there was no way to get the wheelchair into the movie, but they were. They didn't think they were doing it for people who could get kicked out of their apartments because they were gay, but they were. And so we're dealing with this constantly widening notion. Now today, there are people who are not citizens of this country doing a lot of the work that gets done every day in this country. And the challenge for us now and there are people on all sides of the issue, is whether they are fully invested with a set of claims because they're human beings that they can make on us, not because they're citizens. Two different statuses. So if they get picked up by a landscaper in the morning, they're standing on a corner near a Home Depot, and a pickup truck comes by and puts five of them in the back, and they go work all day, and then at the end, the employer tells them to go get lost, and doesn't pay them, to whom do they complain? Is this a human rights violation? Is this a civil rights violation? Is it um, something that they can turn to the local authorities and say, I too have a claim on your attention. Even though I didn't ask your permission to be here, even though I'm not a citizen, even though I'm not, in your view, a legitimate member of this community, do I have a claim on your attention? And we haven't quite worked that out yet, whether that person does have some claim to the same humanity that I, as a citizen, and you as a citizen, uh, do. That's part of a long argument 
that goes all the way back to the original arguments in 1789. It's not divorced from it. It's not a separate thing from it. It runs like a thread through our entire history. So whether they're working with um, produce that's sprayed with poisons that cause permanent nerve damage, cognitive defects, uh, tremors permanently in your hands after you've worked picking vegetables for five or 10 or 15 years, or terrible uh, chromosomal damage that you then pass on to the children that you never even really thought about having someday, uh, whether it means that you're a member of one of the four and a half million people who live in mixed status families in this country, where some of the members of the nuclear family are citizens and some of them are not. Some of them live in constant fear of deportation and some of them don't. This is a challenge to us today and there is a legitimate argument. The people who want to send them home are not all bad people and they're not all racist and they're not all wrong. Every country in the world has the right to control its borders and know who lives inside its country. So there is a legitimacy to that argument. But if you both use them, use them like human harvesting machines and steal their wages and don't send them home, well, that just seems to be a little bit too much. Roger. <clears throat> Ray, I, um, since I've had all these negative things to say all day, <laughs> um, um, I'll say a positive thing, or tell you a little positive little story. Um, at my, well, first I would say, when you get to the place in life where I am, which is to say, uh, within 30 days, I will step through the thing, and why, God, I'll be 80 years old. And I say to myself, my God, this is a different country than I was born into. It's so much a better, there's, there's, God knows there's terrible stuff still here. The banks. The Ponzi's um, and lots of crooks. But look at you, you, you. Here we are. It wouldn't have been a hundred years ago, I'll tell you that. And we did that. We Americans changed the country in extraordinary ways. But we don't tell the story very well. I mean, we tell the old story, you know. General Washington, a good old Abe, FDR, but now everything, all this stuff is too big for us. And I don't think it's too big for us. And I think probably much of the responsibility of changing things um, should go after digging into people like me, like Ernie, God knows, like you. How did folks make this country a better country? And what is it that we now need to continue? We can't just sit around in our fancy cars and fancy houses and say, God, we're a swell country, when there is so much more to do. And doing it is the best stuff. I mean, I will say to you that to have done the journalism, my dear pal here, to done a little bit of TV and the shows that he is on, to be motivated by a picture of Ernie and his, and his co-activists. They all, they all give great energy, but there's something, something that we need to do, and that is that we need 
more people building <coughs> and fewer people reaching in to what can I get today? How bigger car than yesterday and so forth. We can teach each other that America is worth taking care of. Our schools, our hospitals, our police departments, all these things need work. And people can find that out. One of the things that makes me almost cry for <coughs> joy is that I have a daughter who's about to turn 30. She could be working in the White House right now. And most people who had, and because she was a terrific campaigner, um, and most people who get a job at, in the White House when they're that age think that uh, that's enough. They'll stay at the White House the rest of their lives. This young woman is, gave up the job and went back to school, to Yale Law School, because she has seen the issues of Americans coming, people coming to America and not being treated fairly, decently, honorably. She then took a little stint with the Service Employees Union, found a whole bunch of stuff that she thought needed to be changed and fixed. And so she's at Yale Law School and she's going to be, <laughs> the first thing she's going to be is an immigration lawyer. I, um, I had oh. all, I just want to say, it, it, we have to take care of this country. It's not going to be a terrific country forever unless we take it take care of it on a regular basis, not sniff a snoop, but this is, you know, I could say I'm a, I, was a journal, I was a journalist and I was a, a, I was a lawyer, I was this and that, but basically I was a citizen. I was just a citizen who really thought the place was great. Uh, particularly when Jackie won the World Series, that was really good. <laughs> I had a uh, last question for um, each panelist, and um, you, are an you already answered the question that I wanted to ask you. And let me just quote briefly from Roger Wilkins' lovely book, Jefferson's Pillow, in which he writes uh, that the greatest legacy of our founding fathers is the opportunity this nation allows each of us to engage in struggles for decency. Evil, he writes, is a basic element of nature. The seeds are in all of us. Good has to be manufactured and pushed energetically into public affairs. It is willed into the world by human effort. Roger Wilkins. So we're running out of time. I have a final question for all three of you. And Alita, I thought, uh, what would Eleanor Roosevelt say to us today as we were leaving this conference? She would say the last sentence she ever wrote, staying aloof is not a solution, it is a cowardly evasion. And that we cannot leave our problems to the government, we are the government. And uh, from Alita's book, um, Alita has a lovely quote in her book from Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, you're going to live in a dangerous world, but it's going to be an interesting and adventurous one. I wish you the courage to face yourselves and your prejudices, and when you know what you really want to be, and when you know what you really want to fight for, not in a war, but in order to gain a peace, then I wish you imagination and understanding. God bless you. May you win. Eleanor Roosevelt. My girl. So Charlene, there's a lovely moment in uh, your memoir where you're there, a young uh, student at the University of Georgia, and the phone rings, and it's James Meredith. <laughs> and James Meredith is in the process of trying to integrate the University of Mississippi. And at first, you don't believe that it's him, uh, but finally you do. And basically, he asks for advice from what he calls a fellow traveler. And I thought, what advice would you give to the fellow travelers, especially the young people today who are either defending their own rights or the rights of others? 
But again, to go back in history, uh, my grandfather, who was uh, presiding elder in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, used to tell his son, my father, and his uh, other son, my uncle, get an education, boy, boys. That's going to be the key to your liberation. And I think that is what propels so many generations of young uh, black people. But I think if we bring it forward to today, I, 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 as a journalist, I, I, I tend to ask questions much more than I give statements. So my question would be, um, who is educating our young people, this next generation, I guess you call them now the millennials, you all are the millennials, um, to, to, to be the giants for the next generation to stand on there, to, whose shoulders you're going to provide to stand on. And I think that, you know, Edward R. Murrow used to talk about uh, television as an instrument that could teach, that could illuminate, that could inspire. And as I said earlier, I'm not sure that most television is doing that these days with the exception of Callie and Ray and the News Hour. But we, we need people, citizens, no matter what their age is, to be educated to the, to the promise of this country. And one of the promises was, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Send these the homeless tempest tossed to me. In just a few years, and I forget the exact year, maybe 20, 20, 20, 20, 20 two thirds of the American people are gonna be people of color. Mm -hmm. And the people who are now in the majority are gonna be in the minority. So we have a lot of work to do in terms of understanding our fellow men and women, uh, being receptive as we were to generations of immigrants going back to the days that they put those words on the Statue of Liberty. We've got to understand what kind of country we're living in and wh where our country is going and how we're going to keep it true to the thing that make you, makes you happy and inspired, that makes you happy and inspired. Because the, the, the issues that you're dealing with now, even though there's controversy, when you get married, that's going to be another step towards acceptance. There are many things. All of the things that all of us hope that we're doing are helping, but we need more educated people to understand what this country is now, what it's becoming, and what we want it to be when it changes into the permutations that it's going to go through and what it's going to become in the future. Great. Uh, uh, so I told Ray I was going to quote from uh, his first book, The Old Neighborhood, What We Lost in the Great Suburban Migration. He writes this. We were among the first Americans. Why are we still strangers? The people we refer to as Latinos or Hispanics drew their first breath when an infant was born nine months after Christopher Columbus arrived in the New World. 500 years later, we bust your tables, watch your kids, pick your strawberries, lay your sod, and frighten you on darkened streets. We fill up your jails, fight your wars, and populate your dreams of immigrant invasion and fabulous sex. Yet we are still strangers. Uh, so Ray, comment on how the Latino experience fits into this national conversation on civil rights. And uh, your daughter's here, my two children are here, and I can't quite believe I talked about fabulous sex in front of them, but um, <laughs> <laughs> what, what's the advice that you give to young people today? Well, right now I'm writing uh, a book. I'm sorry I don't have my book here to hang hold up. Uh, <clears throat> But I'm, I, <laughs> 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 but I'm. Uh, you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> I'm writing a um, a history of Latinos in America since the end of the Mexican War, and right now I'm immersed in the chapter about the Latino civil rights movement, which follows on the heels of the great struggles for Black civil rights in this country, and whether it's the Brown Berets or the Young Lords, or La Raza Unida, um, or in more establishment circles, Henry Gonzalez or Ruben Salazar. Um, these men and women, Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, went to school on what black Americans did, uh, organizing with their bodies, with their lives, with their passion. 
and understood that uh, those, those struggles are never over, that understood that it was going to be different because it manifests itself in a different way and our history is different and the reasons we're here are different, but that humanity is humanity and playing fair is playing fair and those people, uh, those men and women were going to do what was necessary to make America pay attention. I don't think they could have imagined in 1965, in school strikes in LA Unified, in attempts to force integration and school lunches in, in Phoenix and uh, in uh, the Rio Grande Valley in Texas. I don't think they could have imagined um, a country where in 2010, for the first time, more children were born in this country who traced their ancestry to Africa, Latin America, and Asia than to Europe for the first time ever. That's the front edge of the wedge that Charlene was talking about. But America is still going to be built on that same DNA. America's still going to be America once that change happens and once those children reach their maturity and are running things instead of just being told what to do. And so it means everybody has to stretch a little bit. And we did it before. We've done it before. We've, we're constantly stretching and, in, and expanding that notion of who's worthy of my attention and my care and my inclusion. So we're going to do it again. But there's a lot of bad stuff that happens between now and the time that we, we finally get it. There always has been. Every new people that's come to this country has had to get hazed first. And after they're hazed, then they're in. And once you're in, you eventually get to run things. So just think of all the people who are just part of our common culture today whose own parents or grandparents never could have done the wonderful things that they're doing. That's the great genius of America. We're going to get it right. We always do eventually. And so, um, I mean, don't flag. Roger's right when he says America needs constant care and watering. But also, don't be discouraged, because we always do eventually get it right. So. Oh, but, um... And it's fun, you know? I mean, we've, stuff, you know, we've talked about struggle, we've talked about violence, we've talked about death, but the friendships that you make in the struggle are friendships that are unbreakable. They will last you, if there's reincarnation, they will last you lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. And so for the young people that are here, go do this. If you're not doing it for your country, do it for yourself and do it for the profound relationships that you can make and the courage and the joy that that will give you. Oops. Uh, in his memoir, Roger Wilkins quotes one of his mentors, Thurgood Marshall, who once told a reporter that he hoped subsequent generations would look back on his life and say, quote, he did the best he could with what he had. Uh, we tried to cover a lot of territory in this conference, but I hope we did the best we could with what we had. I want to especially thank our wonderful conference speakers. And, um, can bring the screen down. Let us end uh, with the words of the man whose memory we honor in this library, paired with images of the struggles, the civil rights and human rights struggles that we face today. John F. Kennedy. The United States of America is opposed to discrimination and persecution on grounds of race and religion anywhere in the world, including our own nation. This nation was founded by men of many nations and backgrounds. It was founded on the principle that all men are created equal. And this is a matter which concerns this country and what it stands for. I believe in an America where religious intolerance will someday end, where all men and all churches are treated as equal, 
It ought to be possible, in short, for every American to enjoy the privileges of being American without regard to his race, race or his color. color. Change has come to America. I ask the support of all of our citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming.